Alright, hello everyone. Uh, welcome back to Wu Can Cook. My name is Wesley. Uh, this is Wu Can Cook. Today we're doing a General Sal's chicken uh, based off of a recipe hack that I wrote uh, that was hacking a Panda Express recipe for their General Sal's chicken. Uh, the version that we're doing today is not really anywhere close to the Panda Express version anymore um, because we deviated quite a bit when we wrote that recipe. Um, if you're interested in following along and checking out this recipe yourself, I definitely recommend hopping over to YouTube and checking out that recipe because there's lots of fun stuff going on over there, uh, including the recipe to this particular dish. What happened to my event list? Let's fix this little event list. Excuse me while I fix my event list. Yeah. Maybe. No. Maybe not. Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, if you're interested in reproducing this particular version of General Tso's chicken yourself, uh, there's a fun recipe video that we did which essentially deconstructed the General Tso's chicken from Panda Express uh, and then reassembled it uh, without all of the American qualities that you find in Panda Express's version. So in the original Panda Express version, there are a number of things that they're doing uh, that are not actually, uh, number one, not actually traditional to Chinese, Chinese cooking, but also uh, number two, not very traditional according to how General Tso's chicken is assembled even. Um, so even uh, specifically outside of Amer Chinese American food, it is also not very standard. Uh, because the Panda Express version actually contains a number of different veggies. I think it contains two different kinds of bell pepper and uh, bean, green beans, I think, uh, which you don't normally find. So uh, the version that we're going to be doing today is going to dive into a little bit about like how uh, that the hack recipe that I had written uh, looks sort of like what makes that recipe tick, what kind of like makes the Panda Express version work. Uh, and then we're going to deviate quite a bit from there uh, and sort of dive into our own version of the General Sauce Chicken and take a look at how that's going to be assembled. Uh, I'm going to be frying my chicken today using the J. Kenji Lopez Alt uh, method of double frying. So if you have not experimented with double frying chicken, um, I highly recommend doing so because it is, uh, in my experience, the number one best way of getting a really, really crunchy chicken. Um, I honestly don't know why everyone isn't double frying their chicken at all times. <clears throat> it's my one of my favorite uh, techniques for double uh, for frying chicken, and essentially what's happening is we're going to fry it once, uh, very very briefly. So we're going to very undercook our fried chicken. So we're going to fry it for about a minute or two, uh, and then we're going to pull it out and then cool it down for about two to five minutes. Uh, and then we're going to put it back in the fryer. And what's going to happen is after the first fry, uh, all of the moisture from our chicken is going to get pulled out of the chicken breast. And then we're going to put it back in the fryer. Uh, and there won't be very much moisture left, which means that we'll be able to get a really, really crunchy piece of chicken after that, uh, which kind of leaves us with <coughs> a very, very tender uh, piece of chicken inside of the breading while the breading outside is still extremely crunchy. So uh, one of my absolute favorite methods for frying chicken. Uh, and it is... Uh, I don't know if he invented it, but he's certainly the guy who made it very, very popular, uh, which is J. Kenji Lopez, if you're following uh, him on YouTube. And that's where I picked it up. Uh, and I believe it's actually a recipe that he did for Siri. So, <clears throat> so uh, as with uh, most of the things that I cook, pretty much, I guess, uh, I'm starting off with some crushed and minced garlic, followed by some finely minced ginger. Uh, as you can see, my ginger is not looking super hot today, so I'm chopping around it quite a bit. Um, that's 
also too much ginger. Uh, <clears throat> what was I saying? Oh yeah, uh, so as with many savory dishes that I cook, uh, I'm starting off with some crushed and minced garlic followed by some finely minced ginger. You'll find that these two ingredients, they come up a lot in Chinese cooking. Uh, uh, in fact, I would say they come up in uh, almost every single wok stir fry that I have ever made. Uh, and that's because they work really, really fundamentally as the first two baseline ingredients of umami. So when we're trying to like uh, develop layers of umami, uh, garlic and ginger, they still seem to uh, work as the like fundamentals. So uh, we start there and then we build on top. So it's not that everything needs to taste like garlic and ginger, it's that uh, it's the first two places that we start. Can I read comments about chopping garlic? I, I can actually, so... Yeah. Um, actually, we could talk about that. Yeah, so uh, that's actually a really good point to bring up. So very important knife technique. So lots of people ask me about like uh, knife chopping or like knife technique and how to properly chop. So it's super, super important. Um, and like uh, I mentioned this earlier on the, the stream yesterday too, actually. So uh, the like the number one thing that we want to think about when we're chopping, it's actually not about speed. It's about it's about safety. And if you uh, learn how to chop safely, you'll you'll eventually learn how to chop really, really fast because the key to chopping really fast is making sure that you can chop safely first. Uh, so what we want to do is you never want your fingers on the board. So you don't ever want to see people cutting like this. Uh, even just like looking at this, um, like right now, it kind of makes me anxious. Uh, what we always want to do is our fingers are curved inwards. So we have this, this is called a claw. Uh, and what's happening is my fingers are curved inward and then my knuckles are lining up with the, the edge of my plate. So it kind of looks like this. So uh, at all times, my, my, the middle finger, my middle finger knuckle is uh, touching the blade, which means that as long as I have that middle finger uh, knuckle touching the blade, then I always know where the knife is. So I can look up, I can look down, I can look everywhere, uh, and I always know where that knife is because I'm feeling it with my, with my knuckle. So uh, worst case scenario, and this has happened to me uh, all the time, this happens to me all the time, uh, is that you might pull the knife up too far. Uh, so you want to be careful not to pull the knife up too far. Uh, and then when you come down, you can uh, come down on the knuckle, your, the skin of your knuckle, which is uh, probably the worst possible thing that you can do uh, with a claw technique. So if you come down too fast uh, and you pull the knife up too far, uh, you'll come down on your knuckle, and then that's why you'll find frequently find lots of lots of cooks and chefs uh, will have scars on their knuckles, so you can see. You can kind of see it. Uh, there, are, I think there's like three different scars on this knuckle uh, because I have uh, scraped skin off uh, like a bunch. Uh, but you're not going to lose a finger, you're not going to like <coughs> cut a fingernail off, anything like that. Uh, worst case scenario is you're going to give your, yourself a, a nasty scrape. Uh, so yeah, <coughs> super, super important uh, key to knife, or key to the real key to chopping stuff. Uh, it's all about safety first. So as long as you learn how to chop safely, then you can learn how to chop really, really fast. Uh, and then from there, once you learn how to chop properly with a proper claw technique, uh, then it's really just the only thing holding you back is your courage, is how fast, how fast do you have the courage to chop, <laughs> really. Uh, and you can look up, you can look down, you can look anywhere you want after that. Once you know where the knife is, uh, you're going to do okay. <clears throat> Alright, so that's my garlic and ginger. Those are going to be the very first two things that we throw into our wok before we start stir-frying. Uh, and those are going to be the first baseline la layers of umami that we work with. Uh, so that's going to really like, you could think of those as like the fundamental building blocks of umami. So before we do anything else, we're going to start with garlic and ginger. With lots of comments. Uh, peeling the ginger with, with a spoon sparks joy. Yeah, uh, that's my favorite, my favorite uh, hack, or I guess it's like Chinese food hack or, or whatever you want to call it, is uh, peel, peel your ginger with the back of a spoon. Uh, don't you don't need you don't need a p potato peeler or anything like that for ginger um, That stuff is super super thin and easy to come off uh, So you can absolutely just use the soft side of a spoon and it'll come right off Ooh, yeah, any recommendations for uh, purchasing a walk? Yeah uh, <laughs> Someone someone already knows uh, Let's see uh, yeah, D, D. McGee definitely has watched these streams before. So if anyone has watched these streams before, you'll know that uh, I have a couple of things that I recommend when I go walk shopping. Um, and the main thing that I look for when I'm shopping for a walk, it's actually not a brand. Uh, I don't particularly care about brands. Um, 
what I'm really looking for is what the the material of the wok is made of. So uh, my wok is, is made of carbon steel, so I love a really, really good carbon steel wok. I also used to own a really, really great uh, cast iron wok, both of which have really, really high heat potential. Um, so both work really, really well as a wok. Uh, cast iron, the only problem with cast iron is that it's going to be really, really heavy. So when I had a cast iron wok, you could think about like a 12, my 12 inch cast iron skillet weighs like uh, maybe almost 20 pounds. Uh, so a cast iron wok, I think that thing weighed like 40 pounds. Um, but it stayed hot for, you could keep, you could turn the fire off and that wok would stay hot for at least another 15 minutes. Uh, because it's just made of one giant piece of cast iron, so it's going to be hot for a long time. Uh, so that's when people ask me how to uh, what, what to wok, how to wok stir fry on an induction top. Uh, that's probably the first thing that I recommend: is get, get yourself a cast iron wok, and you you don't even have to worry about heat retention. You don't even have to worry about your stove top. You could just heat the wok up, and it will just stay hot forever. Um, but if you're looking for a good wok and you do have a gas range, I would say uh, anything car uh, carbon steel or stainless steel, both of which work really, really well. Uh, mine is a carbon steel, so we can take a look at my wok really quick. Uh, so this is my wok. There's some hot oil heating up in it. Uh, it's a nice carbon steel. Um, and as long as you get something made of carbon steel, a carbon, carbon steel has this nice property about it where it develops a really nice seasoning over time. Uh, so it doesn't, we don't have any, any we don't have to worry about like non-stick uh, surfaces scraping off. It eventually just builds over time. Uh, so that's my favorite is carbon steel. Um, if you can't, if you live in a Chinatown area, you can find one. At, uh, I picked mine up at a restaurant supply company, a store uh, here in Oakland called Chenko. Um, uh, if you don't live, live near a restaurant supply store, though, you can uh, uh, find them on Amazon. Uh, I love the Joyce Chen carbon steel if, uh, if you can't, uh, can't get one in Chinatown. Yeah, hell, whoa, yeah, there's so many people. Cool. Hello to everyone just joining. My name is Wesley. This is Wu Kang Cook. I just noticed that there are so many different people here, which is really cool. Um, if this is your first time tuning in, I know there are lots of folks who have tuned in before. Uh, that are probably watching these streams. But if this is your first time tuning in, we're here streaming every Tuesday and Thursday at 6.30 p.m. PST. Uh, Wednesdays at 6 p.m. PST, right around this time. Um, <clears throat> and every Friday, there's a new recipe that comes out over on my YouTube channel, which if you're watching on Reddit, would be the YouTube channel at the bottom of the screen. Uh, there's lots and lots of fun recipes popping up over there, uh, including the recipe for this particular General Tso's chicken. So uh, what we've been doing over on YouTube, we've had a couple of different uh, recipe series that have been going on. Uh, uh, the General Tso's chicken that I'm cooking today is part of a larger series that I've been doing uh, that's entirely devoted to uh, reproducing foods from Chinese American uh, cuisine, or specifically Chinese American cuisine, uh, which is really, really fun because essentially what we're doing is deconstructing American food because Chinese American food, in my opinion, uh, is not really Chinese food anymore. It's really just, just American food. Uh, and that's really interesting to do because uh, what we're essentially doing is taking apart these things that people think are Chinese Chinese food, but it's really just American food. Uh, and usually what I'll do in that series is I'll take uh, take apart a Panda Express dish or something like this, uh, and then I'll remove all of the American qualities. So with this particular dish, what I ended up doing was removing a whole bunch of brown sugar. Uh, brown sugar and honey, I think, were the two elements that came up a lot uh, in this the original General South Chicken for Panda Express that I had written. Uh, and then what I'll usually do is reassemble it without all of that sweetness and kind of reassemble it with a few more like traditional Chinese ingredients. Uh, so what we're using today in lieu of that brown sugar is going to be... Uh, we're using a little bit of mirin, which actually comes from Japanese cooking. Uh, and then, oh yeah, my, my, the number one, my favorite thing that we're using today uh, is a Chinese black bean paste, which is going to be really, really interesting uh, because it's going to give us a whole bunch of... Uh, umami that you probably will never taste in Chinese American food. So what we end up with is this dish uh, that is like, so General Tso's chicken is like a really quintessential iconic piece of Chinese American cuisine, uh, but it tastes like something that you have never tasted in Chinese American food because it has a whole bunch of black bean paste in it, which comes from uh, like really traditional Chinese uh, cooking. So a lot of the ingredients that we use in some of these recipes, uh, they're really, really common in Chinese cooking, but not super common in Chinese American cooking. So, um, so, if you're interested in some stuff like that, uh, definitely hop over to YouTube, check out the series. Uh, there's a whole bunch of stuff that we've done from Panda Express. We did their General Tso's, uh, honey sesame chicken, kung pao chicken, uh, the Beijing beef. I am uh, started to, uh, uh, dipping my toes into the, um, the orange chicken, which I'm really nervous about because that one's real classic. Uh, there's a Mongolian beef recipe that's coming up soon. We just started doing some P.F. Chang stuff. Uh, so, if you're interested in stuff like that, definitely hop over to YouTube. Uh, and check out what's going on over there. Uh, in addition to the recipes, that's also where the concurrent live stream lives too. 
Um, so if you're looking for the schedule of everything that I'm going to be cooking, there's a whole schedule over on YouTube uh, that lives over there. So if you uh, wanted to know what I'm going to be cooking next, you can definitely find all of that information over on YouTube, uh, which is where we can currently live stream. So lots of folks already streaming over there. Yeah, DD and Mac just, uh, just tuned in. How's it going? All right, so, oh, well, so many comments. All right, uh, I, know, I know for sure I'm missing lots of comments, so if I miss your comment, uh, feel free to repeat yourself. I definitely, there, there are so many comments I can't keep up anymore. <laughs> uh, but if I miss something and I don't see it, feel free to repeat yourself. Yeah, cool. DD Mac, thanks for tuning in. Um, oh, he, he looked up mirin. Yeah, mirin comes from Japanese cooking. It's a it's a sweet rice wine. So this is our mirin today. Um, mirin, uh, and it comes from Japanese cooking. So it is absolutely not a Chinese ingredient. Uh, but I think it works really really well. Uh, and so almost almost with every ingredient that I come across, at least in Chinese cooking, uh, there's another equ equivalent ingredient that lives uh, in a parallel culture. So. Uh, the the the, in, the ingredient of mirin comes from the fermentation of rice wine, and it comes it lives in Japanese food. Uh, in Chinese food, you find something very similar, but it's called Shaoxing wine, which we're actually going to use uh, as well. So this is Shaoxing wine. Um, in uh, uh, I think of sake as a very very similar thing. Um, blanking on the Korean version, uh, but yeah, I find that like. Uh, all over Asia, you see like parallel uh, parallel ingredients uh, of basically the same thing, or ingredients that are evolved from the same thing. Cool, yeah. All right, so next up, I'm setting up my batter here. So we're not going uh, to be very very complicated with our batter here. This is just a quarter cup each of uh, flour and cornstarch plus one egg, uh, and that is uh, it. Oop, I think I just messed this up. I did, yeah, I just started making, I'm going to dump this, I just messed this up. Been uh, too much talking, not paying attention to what I'm doing. All right, let's start that again. All right, so what we're going to do, what I actually just started doing and then backed out of it was I just started making a tempura batter, which is not what we want to do. So what we're going to do is actually set up a really, really basic uh, fry station. So this is going to be uh, one egg, which we're going to whisk up. Uh, and this is going to be the wet half of our wet and dry uh, fry station. We're going to set that aside. And then what we're going to do, <laughs> it's okay, yeah, we all make mistakes. I make a lot of mistakes, I can for sure admit to that. Uh, and then what we're going to do is set up our dry ingredients in a separate bowl. So uh, I've been doing a lot of tempura batters lately, which is why I just defaulted into doing a tempura batter, which is not what we're trying to do. So uh, the dry station is going to be a quarter cup each of AP flour and cornstarch. Uh, and then what we're going to do is uh, wash our chicken in the egg uh, and then follow it up in the dry station with this uh, flour and cornstarch. Uh, for those keeping track though, uh, if you were paying attention to what I was doing earlier, uh, that was essentially a tempura batter. So a tempura batter comes together entirely in one bowl. It's not, uh, it's not actually a breading, it's basically just a batter, which is why we call it a batter. Um, <clears throat> which means that it all comes together in one station. So there's egg, uh, there's egg, a little bit of water, and then equal parts cornstarch and flour. Uh, and then we just batter it uh, into a wet batter. Uh, what we're going to do today is actually not a wet batter. We're going to do a wet and then a dry station. So we're going to get to that in a minute. First, though, let's assemble our sauce. Ooh, yeah, what kind of knife? Yeah, lots of people. Oh, how do you full screen? Man, there's so many comments I can't, can't keep up. Uh, how do you full screen? Um, lots of people ask about full screening. Um, I don't know if Reddit supports full screen. Uh, but I know that I have I have been told that the uh, the full screen experience it works better over on YouTube. So um, if you're watching on Reddit and you're trying to full screen, or especially if you're trying to transition to desktop, uh, I recommend hopping over to YouTube because I've been told that the uh, full screen experience is a little. Uh, and if you're watching on Reddit, that would be the YouTube channel at the bottom of the screen. So that's YouTube.com/slash uh, Wu Can't Cook. Uh, lots of folks still. Uh, 
popping up over there already. Yeah, what kind of chef's knife? Totally. Uh, so this is a, it's actually not a saboteur. Lots of people think that it's a saboteur. Uh, what it is, is a Perrinois Nogan. Uh, so it's a vintage French chef's knife. <laughs> yeah, Monroe, Ma, so Monroe has, has tuned into these streams many times, so he, he, they already know. Um, uh, it's a vintage French chef's knife from the 70s. Uh, I picked it up as an estate sale for really, really cheap, so I'm super stoked about it. Um, the saboteur, which is, this is a saboteur, uh, it looks very, very similar, so you can tell uh, they're almost identical in size and shape, uh, except this one is a little bit longer. <clears throat> the, the Saboteur is a lot more popular and like definitely the more famous knife. Um, so if you're looking for a similar knife that you're trying to pick up, uh, I would recommend looking into Saboteur because you're probably not going to find this knife. This knife is, uh, I don't think it's in production anymore. All right, so next up what I'm doing right now uh, is I'm assembling the sauce for our General Sauce Chicken. Uh, so you, what you will often see uh, if you're watching like restaurant chefs assemble this stuff uh, is they'll do this all in the wok. So very often uh, you'll see people wok frying in like Panda Express uh, like videos and like uh, commercials and stuff and they'll, they'll just use, they'll literally use a stew ladle uh, and then dump it straight into the wok. Um, and the reason that they can do that and the reason that they can add ingredients straight into the wok like that uh, is because those guys are making the same thing like probably a hundred times a day, like literally a hundred times a day, uh, which means that they're at a certain point, they're probably not even tasting when they're cooking anymore. They're really just like uh, cooking based on muscle memory. Uh, so at that point, you really don't have to do very much to like, um, like understand what the dish is actually going to taste like because you're really just operating on muscle memory. Uh, so when I assemble sauces, what I like to do is assemble them off heat first uh, and then taste. So we can taste, uh, take, a, take a look at what your sauce tastes like and then adjust. So if you are putting it straight into the wok, uh, you're not really going to be able to adjust. You're basically just married to what you just dumped into the wok. So um, <clears throat> Very, very useful if you're not particularly familiar with what you're cooking. Uh, there are some, some recipes that I actually do just put it straight into the wok. Um, and those are usually the dishes that I have made, like actually the dishes that I have actually made over a hundred times. Uh, so like, I don't I don't really measure stuff from mapo tofu anymore because I've been making that stuff since I was a little kid. Uh, things like that, uh, green onion pancakes. I don't really measure things for that stuff. Um, but for the stuff where I'm like under a hundred repeats on it, uh, I definitely I like to measure uh, so we can taste first. All right, so for our sauce, what we're adding right now, that was four tablespoons of soy sauce, uh, one tablespoon of sesame oil, uh, two table, and then two tablespoons each of, that was uh, two tablespoons each of, this is mirin, uh, and this is Shaoxing wine. So Shaoxing wine, it comes from Chinese cooking, uh, and you could consider it like Chinese dry cooking sherry, uh, and mirin comes from Japanese cooking, and you could consider it like uh, sweet rice wine that comes from Japanese cooking, both of which offer quite a bit of sugar and sweetness. Um, so very, very tasty. Um, but that is also going to be where all of the sweetness will come from in our dish today. Do I have any culinary school? I did not. I didn't go to school for uh, cooking. Uh, I went to school for music, so I uh, went to UC Berkeley for music. Um, and uh, I used to play music for a living uh, with a band called Trace Repeat uh, until March of last year, and then the world shut down, and then live music disappeared. Uh, and now I do this, so it's fun. We are weird turns for my life, and here we are. All right, so that was one tablespoon of oyster sauce, uh, and then we're going to add. What are the other things we're adding here? Uh -huh. Dobunja. I think I'm out of black mix. Right, I think that's okay. All right, so I ran out of black bean sauce. So what I'm actually going to substitute it with today is some doubanjang, which is not the same thing, but it is going to be very, very similar. Uh, doubanjang, it comes from the fermentation of red chili pepper. Uh, so you could think of it, that was one tablespoon of doubanjang. Uh, you could think of it very similarly, like I actually get to add a little bit more doubanjang. Uh, it reminds me a lot of the Korean gochujang, or in Japan, in Japanese food, uh, miso paste, both of which, all of which come from the fermentation of a bean. 
Um, so very, very tasty. Uh, and lots of umami that derives from those flavors. Okay. And then the last thing that we're adding here is going to be half a cup of beef stock. Actually, this is chicken stock today. Uh, and that is going to tie everything together. Uh, and that is our sauce. So then I'm going to mix all of this together and then most importantly, taste it. What does it taste like and what does it need? So super important. Lots of people for, uh, especially lots of beginner chefs, uh, they forget to taste. What does it taste like? I'm gonna change it, update it. Uh, I think mine needs a little bit of sugar. So I'm actually going to add a tiny bit of brown sugar to mine. All right, so this is half a tablespoon of brown sugar uh, that I'm adding here. The original Panda Express recipe that I had written, I believe it used uh, almost an entire cup or entire quarter cup of brown sugar. Uh, so it had a lot of sugar in it. Oh yeah, that's there. That's what I'm looking for. Um, this version, it only has a single half tablespoon of brown sugar, so way less sugar. All right. All right, so next up, what I'm using today is, this is some chicken breast. Uh, the only reason that I'm using chicken breast today is because I ran out of chicken thigh. Uh, so we're using chicken breast today. Um, but almost always, whenever I'm deep frying chicken, I like to use chicken breast, or chicken thigh, because it has more fat content, which means that it's going to be a little bit more flavorful uh, and has more sodium content to it. Uh, in this case, it will be just fine. I have definitely deep fried chicken breast before and it will work just fine. Uh, what's more important when you're uh, deep frying chicken breast is that you pay attention and make sure uh, that it's chopped in even sizes. So you'll notice uh, that we're being very care I'm being very careful to make sure that my chicken is all diced in the similar size. So that's very important with chicken breast uh, because you'll notice that certain edges of your chicken breast are larger than others. So uh, the tips of the chicken, it's much smaller and thinner than the other parts. So uh, right here, this would be the smallest part of our chicken breast. Right here would be the larger part of our chicken breast. So uh, we want to be very careful and make sure that all of our chicken is diced in a similar size because otherwise uh, the smaller bits will either overcook and undercook and the larger bits will probably undercook. So we want to pay attention, uh, make sure that everything is diced uh, in a proper size and shape. Oh, brown sugar, yeah. Yeah, brown sugar, definitely one of my favorite ingredients. Um, whenever I'm like at, trying to add um, a really straightforward sweetness to it. So I like, um, I like to uh, be very, very, um, uh, try not to be too aggressive with the brown sugar um, because it is, it is very, very sweet. Obviously it's pure sugar, right? Um, but I also will, what will say is that I love using brown sugar in any time that I can in lieu of white sugar uh, because it has a little bit more depth of flavor uh, and you get more than just uh, pure sweetness, sweetness out of it. So it's not just sugar. Um, you get a whole bunch of other flavor that comes out of it too. Oh, much better on YouTube. Cool. Yeah, I'm glad. <coughs> Cool, where am I reading the chat from? Yeah, so we're, uh... Yeah, K-Dazer, so we're, uh, we're, don't, we're streaming twice, so the first stream is over on Reddit, uh, the second stream is over on YouTube, so there's chats on both, actually, so... Um, I'm reading both chats. All right, so here's our chicken. Right, so what we're going to do is we're going to start breading our chicken next. So, so getting back to our original breading station, uh, we have three bowls. So, uh, very important, a breading station that requires three separate stations. So we have our egg. Uh, this is going to be our wet side. Uh, and then we have our flour and cornstarch. This is our dry side. Uh, and then we have a landing place. So the landing place is super, super important for uh, deep frying because you need somewhere to, for it all to go. So what we want to do, uh, and this is really a really important fundamental technique, is that you have two hands. Uh, one is a wet hand, the other is a dry hand. 
Uh, so we're using our wet hand for the wet ingredients and then we're dropping it into the dry side, uh, coating it in our dry ingredients and then placing it in our uh, sizzle pan. Uh, so very, very important. We don't use the dry side or dry dry hand for the wet ingredients. We don't use our wet hand for the dry ingredients. Uh, and what that does is it prevents a lot of flour and gunk uh, to start building up on your wet hand. Uh, so we have one hand that will always stay dry or at least stay clean. So that uh, will prevent, if you've ever like tried to bread and deep fry chicken uh, and ended up with like a, uh, like a fryer or like a chicken claw, uh, where like everything is stuck to one hand. Uh, that's me. Whoop. I just crossed over. So we want to make sure that our wet hand stays dry, or our wet hand stays wet, our dry hand just stays dry. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, the wet hand, dry hand technique, that's, uh, that's where it comes from. So super, super important technique for deep frying. Uh, and it will keep uh, you, it will save you a lot of stress of like having to wash your, or wash the fry, um, the breading off of your hand every five minutes. Oh, how do I, yeah. How are you using your camera to show? Oh yeah, yeah, so I have a phone. Uh, so the phone is pointing downward. Um, and then I have a laptop in front of me. Yeah, one piece at a time. I like to use just one piece at a time. Uh, that's just to make sure that I have like an even coating on the chicken. So I like to take a little bit of time. Um, it takes a little bit longer, but uh, uh, I think that it works a little bit better. So you like have more of an even coating uh, to it. So you can pay more attention to how each piece of chicken looks and feels. Moderate, moderate Carb Maven, that's a great username. Uh, hello to everyone just joining over on YouTube too. I see lots of people are popping over to YouTube, that's really great. Uh, fun to see so many people popping over there. Uh, hello to everyone just tuning in. My name is Wesley, this is Wu Can Cook. Uh, if this is your first time tuning into one of your, these streams, uh, we're here streaming every Tuesday and Thursday at 6.30 p.m. PST, uh, Wednesdays at 6 p.m. PST, and there's new recipes that pop up over on the YouTube channel every Friday. Uh, so every Friday there's a new recipe, so tomorrow there's a recipe that's coming up uh, for a really great hot and sour soup with shredded chicken that I uh, just finished working out. Uh, that's going to be really, really tasty. Um, in addition to all of the recipe videos, that's also where the concurrent live stream lives. So uh, if you're wondering who the other people that I'm talking to are, if you're watching on Reddit and you're wondering who else I'm talking to, uh, I'm talking to the people who are on the YouTube chat. So uh, lots of people pop, pop over there. Uh, when they move over to desktop. I've heard that uh, it looks a little bit better on desktop if you're trying to full screen it. Um, so if you haven't checked out what's going on over on YouTube, definitely hop over and check that out. Uh, that's also where there's a whole schedule of everything that I'm going to be cooking on stream lives. Uh, so I actually <laughs> frequently forget what I'm supposed to be cooking uh, up until like maybe a couple hours before I cook it. Um, so if you're trying to figure out what I'm going to be cooking next, you can pop over to YouTube uh, and check out that schedule and you can learn what we're going to be cooking next. Uh, lots of people have been doing that and then checking out uh, the parts or the, di the, the dishes that they're interested in, in cooking or watching. Uh, and then you can pick up the ingredients for what we're cooking uh, and then cook along with me. So it's always more fun. Uh, to cook with everyone with other people because then we can talk about the mistakes that we make uh, so we could have talked about um, the uh, tempura batter that i accidentally made yeah cross-contamination yeah so lots of people ask me about cross-contamination uh, i'm not super worried actually the one thing that i'm worried about is these going on Uh, but mainly the, what I like to talk about for cross-contamination is that what I really want to pay attention to are the greens of your green onions. Uh, otherwise, the rest of the stuff that's sitting here, it's not super important to uh, make sure that it stays separate from the chicken uh, because everything else is going to get cooked in wok heat, which means that it's going to have plenty of time uh, to kill off bacteria, E. coli, stuff like that. All of that stuff is going to uh, get cooked off. So we don't need to worry super, uh, too much about uh, cross-contamination because it's eventually going to get cooked. The things that we do need to pay attention to um, are things like the greens of your green onions, garnishes, anything that's not going to get cooked in heat. Uh, those are the things that we want to pay attention to to make sure that we don't cross-contaminate those things. Um, 
but otherwise so you'll notice that there's a next to this bowl uh, air um, so next right next to right next to the flour bowl uh, I think it's on screen still, uh, are the garlic ginger and then the whites of my green onions. All three of those things that are going to go into our wok heat, uh, and they're going to be cooking for a long time in that wok heat before it will even come close to being done or, or eaten, which means that there's going to be plenty of time to kill off all of that bacteria first. So uh, I don't think that that's necessarily um, standard practice in a professional kitchen, but I think that it, was, it will be just fine uh, for home cooking. Yeah, one piece at a time. Yeah, so uh, someone else just asked that too. Uh, I like to bread the chicken one piece at a time because you can uh, pay more attention to what each piece of the chicken looks like. Um, so maybe you could you could rush the egg wash, uh, but I like to pay attention to how well I'm breading the pieces of chicken in the in the dry, uh, and that's to make sure that everything's fully coated and we have nice bits of breading. I have definitely done fried chicken where it's under breaded or over breaded. Uh, if you've ever had General Tso's chicken and it's like way much breading, or if it's like uh, three times more breading than it is chicken, that's because they're not paying attention. They like uh, dump it all into one giant bowl uh, and then jump it all, dump it all into another giant bowl of dry uh, and then they shake it up and then they throw it, throw it into the fryer. So that's uh, how you end up with fried chicken that is like disproportionately breaded. Uh, it's because they're not paying attention to it. So it's, uh, uh, if you're only doing, so what we're doing is just two pieces of chicken breast. Uh, this will probably take, I don't know, we could probably finish this up in like five minutes. Uh, take a li it takes a little bit more time. Uh, but it will absolutely yield a better piece of fried chicken uh, because you paid more attention to it, you know what's going on. Yeah. Cool. Uh, yeah, into the chicken bag. Yeah, I probably should be more careful with that. Um. Yeah. I don't always pay super a huge amount of attention to, to cross contamination. I think that's also one of the big things that kind of makes it uh, clear that I have never worked in a professional kitchen because I don't really work and worry about like uh, uh, like food safety um, because uh, I know where all of my ingredients come from. I'm not really that worried about cross contaminating uh, because all of this stuff is really really fresh. This chicken just came out of. Uh, I just got this chicken today, so it's all going to be fine. But I know that like lots of people freak out about it on the internet, so. Uh, the only time that I ever really worry about cross-contamination is when I know I'm not going to cook an ingredient. Uh, and that's the only time that I really pay attention to, like making sure that the chicken doesn't sit next to uh, things that are not going to get cooked. All right. So that's our chicken. Uh, let's hop over to the stove. I don't have a camera on the stove. So over on the stove, I have, um, I think this is 12 ounces or maybe 24 ounces of vegetable oil heating up in my stove. GoPro takes a long time to start up. There it is. Excuse me while I flip a camera. I guess. Uh, over on the stove is a uh, 12 ounces of vegetable oil heating up to 100, 350 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, this is probably the most important part that you want to be very, very careful. I noticed someone just said, take it slow. Uh, deep frying is very, very dangerous because it has a lot of extremely hot oil going on. So hot oil, it's very different from hot water uh, because hot oil will burn you and then it will continue to burn you. So uh, we don't want to mess around with hot oil in the stove uh, because that stuff will absolutely burn the crap out of your skin. So be really, really careful when you know you have fryer oil going on uh, because that stuff is really, really dangerous. Yeah, yeah, uh, and the phone is not over the wall. Or actually, those aren't phones; they're camcorders. Uh, but they're also really cheap camcorders, for sure. Uh, is vegetable oil the best to use for deep fry? Um, you could really use any kind of neutral oil. So actually, I don't think it's vegetable oil. It actually might be canola oil. 
Um, I really, what I use is just the, the cheapest kind of oil that I can find um, because it doesn't last very long. So you, the, the oil will only last for three or four fries, uh, no more than five fries. Usually by the fifth fry, I just recently changed my vegetable, my fryer oil. Uh, and usually by the fifth fry, uh, it's like pretty, it's pretty brown uh, and really, really dark. Uh, so I usually just go for the cheapest kind of oil that I can find, which ends up being canola oil very often. Uh, but as long as it's neutral, uh, you'll be okay. Uh, so canola oil, vegetable oil, um, both of those will work really great. Grapeseed oil I've used plenty of times, that works fine too. Um, we don't, we, what we don't want to use are things like peanut oil, probably won't work very well. Um, also like olive oil, or really anything that's high heat, we don't want to use anything that's uh, low heat. So olive oil, stuff like that, stuff that's not neutral, uh, is not going to work super great in the fryer. Uh, because it will impart the flavor of uh, whatever whatever the oil tastes like. So. Alright, so I'm adding my chicken. This is maybe 20 pieces at a time. Uh, we're going to do this in two separate batches. Uh, and we want to be very careful not to overload our wok here. So. Uh, we want to pay attention to how much is going on in that wok uh, because if you put too much stuff in that wok uh, then you're going to have trouble keeping the temperature of the oil high and the high temperature of the oil is going to be really really important uh, in order to make sure uh, that you get a nice crisp edge to the chicken uh, so what we're doing is so we're going to do our double fry so a double fry is very specifically uh, obviously two fries so the first fry it's very very quick we're only going to fry it for about a minute maybe two minutes uh, and then we're going to pull it out uh, and then we're going to fry it again. So we're going to pull it out and we're going to let it cool down. Uh, and a lot of moisture is going to start pulling out of that chicken. So once all of that moisture pulls out, uh, then we're going to add it back to the fryer. And then you're going to discover that without all of that moisture, uh, the chicken has more of a chance to get really, really crisp. Uh, and that's how you get the probably, uh, in my experience, some of the most crispy chicken that I have ever made is, comes from the double fry. You haven't seen this in person, yeah. That's cool. All right, so I'm pulling my first batch of chicken out. Uh, you'll notice, yeah, I think you can still see it, uh, is that it's pretty pale. So our chicken is not golden. It's, uh, I would describe it as like white um, or like very, very light yellow. Um, so we don't want our chicken to start cooking through here uh, because we want to leave plenty of time for it to cook through in the second fry. Uh, so I'm pulling out my chicken. That was maybe a minute or two. Um, and you can kind of see it. Uh, maybe it'll look better over here. All right, so here's our first fry. Um, I think the, the contrast of the camera is still doing quite a bit of work uh, in saturation, but it is very, very light. Um, uh, and that is very, very intentional. Our chicken is very undercooked right now. And um, what we're looking for uh, is just the opportunity to start leaching some moisture out of that chicken for the first fry. Uh, and then we're going to do our second batch. Uh, so once again, I'm paying attention and making sure that we don't overload our wok here uh, for the same reason as I mentioned earlier. Uh, we want to pay attention and make sure that we don't add too many things to a wok at once because it will drop the temperature of the oil uh, and then you'll come up with a soggy deep fry, which is never good. Is it a cast iron wok? No, actually, so this is a carbon steel wok, so one of my favorites. Uh, uh, this is probably my favorite wok of all time uh, and I think like the real big key to a good wok uh, is all about just cooking on it a lot so I've had this wok for a little over a year now uh, and it has developed a year-long seasoning uh, which is where all of that non-stick surface comes from uh, is carbon steel that's why I love carbon steel uh, but you could do a very similar thing with cast iron too. Of course yeah so the batter um, uh, is it so it's egg washed so there's one egg uh, coated in egg 
uh, and then the dry side is flour and cornstarch. So a quarter cup each of flour and cornstarch, so equal parts. All right, so I'm gonna pull these out again. Once again, you'll notice that our chicken is still very, very white and undercooked. Uh, that's okay, we don't need our chicken to be finished cooking yet, we're just looking for the first fry. All right, and now we're gonna do our last batch. Going in. KFC, yeah, actually, so I did do a, um, I don't know if you're referring to Kentucky Fried Chicken or a Korean Fried Chicken, but I actually did do a Korean Fried Chicken recipe recently. Um, and I think we streamed that, that might have been last week, I think that came out last week. And um, we did the uh, Korean Fried Chicken from Shake Shack, so that's over on the YouTube channel too. Um, that's one of my favorite ways of frying chicken too, is, is the Korean Fried Chicken. Um, we did a really nice gochujang glaze. Does the stove have a large burner for the wok, or is it just a, uh, so it's a, um, yeah, good question, actually. So it's, a, it's just a regular gas burner, um, but uh, my wok is a, is a round wok, a round bottom wok, and I will show you when I pour off the, the, uh, the, the cooking oil. Uh, but there's a wok ring under, underneath it, so super important uh, when you're using a round bottom wok and you're deep frying, uh, is to have that wok ring down there. Otherwise, the round bottom wok will absolutely just start rolling around, uh, and then it gets super, super dangerous. Um, because uh, the, the oil starts uh, kind of like wandering around on your stove top, so I could I think I could show you. So underneath the wok, there's my wok ring. Uh, the wok ring, all it is is just a ring uh, that's fitted to the size and shape of the round the round bottom of the wok, uh, and that just keeps it from like rolling around and stuff. Uh, when I finish deep frying, I usually will remove that wok ring, uh, and then. Um, <coughs> Uh, and then, uh, then I like to just, uh, when I wok fry, uh, just normal wok fry, I like to just cook uh, just right on the stove top. All right, so I'm adding my chicken back to the fry again. So this is going to be our second fry. Cool, uh, and I'm going for about 20 pieces uh, uh, for each fry, uh, and I'm being very careful to make sure that we don't overload the fryer oil here, uh, so that we don't end up with soggy fried chicken, which is never fun. Uh, does the chicken ever stick together? Yeah, so Steve, it, uh, to answer your question, it does stick together, uh, but it only that only happens when you overload the wok, so uh, that has absolutely happened to me before, uh, and it's really just a sign that you did something wrong. <laughs> um, but half, I've definitely made that mistake before, for sure. Uh, well, yeah, what do I do with the extra fryer oil? Um, so usually what I'll do is, uh, when I'm done cooking, I'll pour it off into a large bowl. Um, I have a specific bowl that I like to use for my fryer oil. Obviously, it has to be heat proof, uh, but I think actually another more important element about the bowl that you put your oil in uh, is that it needs a spout so that you can pour it. Uh, and then what I like to do is I let it, I let it chill, uh, I let it cool down, uh, and then I'll pour it through a uh, cold brew coffee filter, uh, which will remove all of that like particulates and stuff. And all of that stuff, it will come out um, through the coffee, cold brew coffee filter. Uh, cold brew coffee filter, it works really well uh, because it's a filter that's specifically designed for uh, uh, filtering cold, cold wood uh, ingredients. Uh, and then I usually get away with uh, reusing the fryer oil maybe three or four times. Uh, I think I've done it, pushed it as far as like five times. 
Uh, usually by the fifth fry though, uh, you probably shouldn't have, you should, you should probably stop using it. Uh, and then you just gotta throw it away, but uh, definitely don't just throw it away though, you gotta recycle that stuff. All right, so I'm pulling my first batch of chicken out of the fryer for its second fry. Uh, and you'll notice that I'm putting it down under a paper towel and that's going to catch some of this uh, remaining vet, uh, vegetable oil that kind of sticks around. Uh, which means we can take a look at it. So over here is my finished chicken. Uh, it is a deeper golden brown uh, and it's probably very, very crunchy. Probably the most crunchy pieces of fried chicken uh, that I have ever encountered. So let's do our second batch. And that's it. Yeah, what do we fry next? So right now, <laughs> uh, right now we're putting our chicken back in for the second fry. And what's going to happen is after that first fry, uh, you could even see it actually. Uh, you can kind of see it. So at the bottom of the bowl of the first fry that I had, uh, there's quite a bit of moisture. All of that is moisture that has removed from the chicken. Um, so once you pull out all of that moisture, what happens is uh, when you put it back into the fryer, since it doesn't have all of that moisture, uh, you can get a much crispier piece of chicken. Um, and every, every type of fry, fry technique that I've come across, it works better with the double fry. So I've done it with a, a tempura batter, uh, I've done it uh, southern fried, uh, I've done Nashville hot wings uh, similar, I've done Korean fried chicken with the same technique. Uh, and every single time, without fail, uh, with every type of fried chicken that I have ever experimented with, uh, it works better with that double fry because it gets you a more crispy fried chicken. Uh, and if, unless you're not looking for crispy fried chicken, which actually in a couple cases I have uh, been aiming for, uh, it's always going to be better. Deep fried ice cream. Ooh, yeah. I'll add that to the list. Uh, deep fried ice cream could be tricky. I'm not actually sure how they do that. Did I raise the temperature? Yeah, so I did raise the temperature. Uh, my, um, so you notice that there's no thermometer in my wok right now. Uh, and that's because I broke my third third fryer um, uh, candy thermometer last week. Uh, so I don't have a candy thermometer, so I actually don't know what the temperature of the fryer is. Um, but I do have the fire on higher than the first fry. So the first fry is at medium high heat. Uh, the second fry is at extremely high heat. So the highest that, that it will go. Uh, what I usually like doing when I have a thermometer in there though, uh, is I like frying it first at 350. Uh, and then I like to do the second fry at 4, 425. Uh, and that's just to, the 425 is just to accommodate for a little bit of overage. Uh, so that temperature is going to drop back down to closer to 400 uh, by the time it finishes cooking. So our chicken is about done. And we can actually take a look at it. So here's our finished fried chicken. Uh, it is very deep golden brown. You'll notice that there are lots of big curds of um, like bubblage. Uh, and that bubblage is where all of that like crispy bits of breading comes from. Uh, so that's really, really important to getting a really crispy fried chicken um, is all of that bubble. All right, so back over to the stove. Uh, we need to remove our fryer oil, and I'm actually going to try and show you guys how I remove the fryer. Um, so underneath my wok is my wok ring, so we don't want this wok uh, for the wok fry uh, because it will get in the way, uh, but we do want it for the deep fry. So what I'm going to do is I have a heat-proof bowl and we're gonna pour the oil very carefully out. 
uh, and then we're gonna let this cool down so this will take quite a while to cool down uh, so in my experience the fryer oil it usually takes about uh, 6 to 12 hours to chill uh, fryer oil takes a long time to cool down uh, and then what we're going to do is I'm gonna put it through a cold brew coffee filter and that's going to help us uh, remove all of the particulate matter so you could actually take a look at our wok uh, all of that stuff see how there's a bunch of grime and stuff that's left behind all of that stuff it leaches into your fryer oil so if you're trying to reuse your fryer oil you need to filter all of that stuff out first <clears throat> so I'm putting my wok back on the stove uh, and then we're going to reheat it I just gave it a quick rinse to get all of that excess grime off uh, and then we're going to reheat it and then we're going to do our wok fry and you will notice that from here on out the rest of the stir fry is going to come together within like under five minutes uh, the rest of the stir fry is basically just splash cooking which means uh, we're going to be doing it on extremely high heat which means that it's going to happen really really quickly so Cool. Uh, hello to everyone just tuning in. My name is Wesley. This is Wu Can Cook. Uh, if this is your first time catching one of these streams, we're here streaming every Tuesday and Thursday at 6.30 p.m. PST uh, and uh, Wednesdays at 6 p.m. PST. Uh, if you haven't hopped over to the YouTube channel yet, I definitely recommend hopping over. Uh, that's where all of the recipe videos for uh, the channel live. Um, those are out every Friday. Uh, usually around Friday morning uh, and those recipe videos they're usually associated to something that I'm cooking on stream uh, so almost everything that I cook on stream it has a recipe video that goes along with it uh, in those recipe videos I usually move a little bit slower and we kind of talk our way through some of the decision making that goes behind uh, why I put certain things in recipes why I leave some stuff out things like that um, this particular uh, recipe or this particular general sauce chicken it comes from a whole series that we've been doing uh, reproducing foods from Chinese American cuisine. Um, so we have done a whole bunch of stuff from Panda Express. So we did the General Sows, the, which is what we're doing today. We did the honey sesame chicken, Kung Pao chicken, uh, Beijing beef. We did the mushu pork from P.F. Chang's, uh, Mongolian beef from P.F. Chang's too. Uh, so all a whole bunch of stuff that all comes from like really, really iconic uh, Chinese American cuisine, which is really fun to do because a lot of those things, they're not really Chinese anymore. So like General Sows chicken, it's not really Chinese. Uh, it's pretty much just American. It's basically what we're eating. Uh, what you're eating is really just American fried chicken with a couple of like Chinese things thrown in. Uh, so it's really interesting to uh, figure out what makes those recipes tick. And then usually what I'll do in that series is I'll remove some of those uh, really, really American qualities. So usually that ends up being a lot of sugar. Uh, and I'll replace it with things that come from like really quintessential Chinese, uh, traditional Chinese cooking. So today uh, what we did was we removed a whole bunch of sugar and I replaced it with Shaoxing wine and Mirin, uh, both of which are quite sweet. Uh, and then I added a little bit of doubanjang and uh, the original recipe calls for some black bean paste, uh, which gives us a whole different whole different dish. Uh, at, at a certain point, it's basically not even General Tso's chicken anymore. It's really just fried chicken uh, with a like a really traditional Chinese sauce base. Uh, so uh, that series is really, really fun because it's basically deconstructing a whole bunch of American food uh, and reconstructing it with like a Chinese lens. So uh, if you're interested in stuff like that, definitely hop over to YouTube. Uh, we've got a hot and sour soup coming out uh, tomorrow, tomorrow morning, actually, for Chinese New Year. So, um, oh, yeah, we can also talk about uh, the stream tomorrow. So I just scheduled a uh, odd stream uh, for tomorrow because tomorrow is Chinese New Year, which I'm super stoked about. Uh, because I found some fresh uh, niangao. Uh, niangao, if you've never uh, seen it before, uh, it looks like this. Uh, it's brown uh, and it's co uh, coated, uh, cooked in egg. Uh, and this is actually what we're going to be cooking tomorrow. Uh, you, it literally translates to year cake. Um, and it's uh, what, you, what you cook on Chinese New Year and it's one of my favorite desserts of all time. Uh, and I actually got my hands on some fresh niangao, uh, which I've never seen before. So this is very, very fresh. I think it was literally made yesterday. So. That's what we're going to be cooking tomorrow, so if you want to tune in for Chinese New Year, hop over uh, and check that out. Uh, uh, the whole schedule of everything that I stream, it lives over on YouTube, so if you're interested in finding out what exactly I'm going to be cooking next, uh, you can hop over to YouTube and check out that schedule. Uh, if you're watching on Reddit, that would be at the YouTube channel at the bottom of the screen, which is youtube.com slash cook. If you're watching on YouTube, you're already there, you made it. 
Uh, so yeah, we're working our way to 2,300 subscribers by the end of the month. So if you want to help us hit that subscriber goal, uh, hop over, check out what's going on over there. I've been told that lots of people like to watch me uh, chop stuff on full screen. So. Yeah, light. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for tuning in. Uh, oh, have I made Shalom Ball? Yeah. Uh, okay, Dazer, uh, that's like one of them on my to-do list. Uh, Shalom Ball is really hard to make. Um, I think I, I know conceptually how to make it, uh, but it's really, really hard to make. It's, uh, Shalom Ball, if you're not familiar, it's a dumpling that has soup inside of it. Uh, and the way that they get that soup in there is that they freeze um, chicken stock, or like soup base, I guess, technically, uh, until it becomes gelatinous. Uh, and then they put that inside of the, the bowl. Uh, which makes it very difficult because you have until that until that uh, chicken stock thaws uh, to finish wrapping the dough it's what, to finish wrapping the bow uh, which means that you have like i don't know a minute to, to, to finish wrapping that thing and those wraps they're not easy to do they, it, like a shalom bow uh, has to have 16 in it that's like what a traditional shalom bow has uh, which is like so hard to do if you have to do it before the the soup melts so um that's something I'm working on. I'm really nervous about trying to figure that one out because it sounds really, really hard. All right, so I'm waiting for my wok to get real hot. It is probably ripping hot. Uh, the way that you can tell if you're not sure if your wok is hot enough uh, is look for the smoke. So you'll notice that we have lots and lots and lots of smoke billowing off of our wok. Uh, that's a good sign that you have a nice hot wok. Uh, if you're still not sure, um, you can add a little bit of oil or a lot of oil. Uh, and take your wooden utensil. So today I'm using a spoon. Uh, when that spoon goes into the wok, there it goes. Uh, you'll see, you should see if it's hot enough. You should see bubbles uh, coming up around that spoon. Uh, so I think you can see it. Yeah, you can see it. Um, those bubbles are an indication that you have enough heat in the wok. If you put uh, oil in the wok and then it doesn't bubble, usually uh, most Chinese cooks would do that with chopsticks. Um, that means that the wok's not hot enough, so stop what you're doing uh, and let it keep heating up first. All right. So, uh, I'm starting off with my aromatic, so this is my ginger going in first, uh, followed by my garlic. And last is the whites of my green onions. Uh, which we're separating. I'm only adding the whites because the whites are durable enough uh, to withstand the wok heat. I'm not going to add those greens because they will absolutely wilt. Um, we're going to use those as garnish instead. Uh, and we're just blooming this long enough until it becomes fragrant, so we're using our nose at this point. Uh, when you start smelling garlic and ginger, that's when you know you're ready to move on. And now goes our chicken. So at this point, not much cooking has to actually happen here. Everything that we just threw in is already cooked. Uh, so really what we're doing is just kind of tossing the combined um, I'm letting the aromatics that we just added kind of become fragrant with the chicken. Uh, and then I'm going to add our sauce. Uh, so what I like to do when I add this sauce is I like to reserve the last maybe a quarter cup of sauce here. Uh, so I have this about this much sauce left behind. Uh, and I like to hold that back to make sure that we don't over sauce here. Uh, so we're going to add uh, and then we're going to look. Do you need more sauce? And if so, add the rest. I guess while that's going, we can look over here. Uh, the last thing that I'm going to put together before we finish off our stir fry uh, is a cornstarch slurry. So this is two tablespoons of cornstarch uh, that we're going to mix together with cold water. Um, you will find that this is the most important ingredient to Chinese food uh, because it's what makes Chinese sauces thick. Uh, so without this, it will still just be a pretty liquidy sauce. Um, 
uh, the cornstarch is what creates thick sauces. So I think of it very similar to uh, the way that pasta water works in Italian. All right, we don't want this to go too long or else the breading in our chicken is gonna start coming apart. So I'm adding my cornstarch uh, and then we're going to toss that to combine. Uh, and you'll notice that as soon as I add that cornstarch, the sauce is gonna start becoming a lot thicker uh, and more luxurious. I'd like it to be a little bit looser, so I'm adding a little bit more water here. Yeah, that'll do it. Uh, and that's pretty much it. Uh, not a lot of cooking actually happening in the wok fry of a general sauce chicken. Most of it happens in the deep fry. Uh, after that, pretty much everything else is already cooked. So. I'm adding a pinch of salt because I think it actually needs a little bit of salt. Uh, but you'll notice that very frequently I don't add any salt to wok fries. Uh, because I actually think, um, personally, I think that's actually a common misnomer is that uh, Chinese cooking it has lots and lots of uh, salt in it. I actually don't think that's true. I think Chinese cooking has lots and lots of umami, uh, which is frequently misunderstood to be salt. I don't think those are the same thing, though, uh, which is why I frequently leave salt out, because I don't think that you actually need a lot of salt. I think that we're looking for lots and lots of umami, though, very different. The wobbly walk makes you nervous. Yeah, um, so lots of people get nervous about that. I actually have gotten very used to it and I, I much prefer it. Um, so lots of people, like what they like to do is cook on their round bottom walks uh, with the walk ring still down. I, I found that I don't like it though because you can't move the walk around as much. Uh, so the round bottom walk, you'll notice that it wobbles quite a bit. And I have absolutely, we should be on the right camera. Uh, I have absolutely dropped this walk before. So a round bottom walk, you'll notice that it rolls around a lot. Um, I, I kind of like that because it kind of makes you have a little bit more control over like uh, your tossing. Um, so it, it, what it also means is that it's very, very different from a standard frying pan, which is flat. Uh, a, a normal frying pan, it has a flat bottom, so it stays very stable. Um, whereas a round bottom wok, you'll notice that it rolls around quite a bit. So you notice that it can go, uh, we can move it around a lot, which uh, uh, the number one thing that, that that means is that if you roll it too much, uh, it will come right off of the stove. Uh, which is very, very dangerous, and I have absolutely done that before on at least two occasions uh, and dropped an entire stir fry in my lap before, uh, which sucks <laughs> because that means that you also don't get to eat it. Uh, but what I find that it was, does do uh, once you get a hang of it uh, is that uh, you can have more agility with how, how you use the wok so we, have, uh, we can toss better. Uh, once that wok ring is down, uh, so once you have this wok ring, it's a lot harder to move around. The wok is kind of stale, uh, stays in place uh, because of this ring, uh, which I don't actually like. Uh, and I find uh, it actually limits the, the, my ability to, uh, to navigate the wok. Uh, so I actually don't use the wok ring once it's down. Um, and I kind of like it being, being a little bit wobbly. But definitely, if you are uh, new to wok cooking, I would not recommend <laughs> using a, a, a round bottom wok because it's going to be really, really uh, nerve-wracking and wobbly. Exactly like you mentioned. All right, so I rinsed out my wok and then I added a little bit of peanut oil back to the wok. Uh, and then we're just coating the whole surface with a little bit of oil. Uh, the bottom too, that includes the bottom. Uh, this is the most important thing to do when you finish cooking in a wok uh, because it's how you protect the wok uh, and make sure that it's usable the next time you want to use it. Uh, if you don't make sure to clean that stuff off, uh, your wok is going to be damaged uh, and that's how you break your wok. Yeah. Cool. Oh, so many people. Yeah, cool. Uh, oh yeah, yeah, so uh, that, that is Mrs. Goose to you. That's a great username. Uh, yeah, it's a carbon steel wok. Um, uh, I love carbon steel. I used to own a, a great um, cast iron wok. I, I don't know what happened to my cast iron wok. I think I might have thrown it out actually um, when I was like 19 and I didn't realize how expensive carbon steel woks were. Um, 
But yeah, I love my carbon steel wok, uh, mainly because I've been cooking on it for a really long time, this wok. Uh, I've probably cooked like four to six meals a week every week for the last like year and a half on it now. Uh, which means that it has a really, really thick seasoning on it. Uh, and that seasoning is where all of the nonstick qualities come from. Uh, so when I first bought this wok, uh, it did not have a nonstick surface. Uh, and it absolutely, like, everything was sticking to the wok. And it was super, super frustrating. Uh, because literally everything that I put in it would stick. Uh, even, like, I would cook, like, chicken in it. And it would stick, the chicken would stick. And I couldn't believe how, like, I don't understand how chicken sticks to a wok, you know? Um, but that's because uh, over the period, over the course of time, carbon steel it develops a seasoning, and I almost gave up on it. I came very close to giving up on it, um, but I stuck, th I stuck with it, uh, and it develop eventually developed a nice nonstick surface uh, that it has that you can see today. Um, but that's really, really important is uh, that you, if if you are using a carbon steel, it, that's not just wax. That's true for any kind of carbon steel, and also uh, cast iron too. Uh, is that the, the way that you make those pans usable is that you have to use it a lot. Uh, and if you don't use it, it won't develop that nonstick surface. So uh, just stick with it. Uh, definitely the first like four to six times that I cooked on it, uh, it was really, really frustrating. And I actually came pretty close to throwing it out because I just could not get stuff to stop sticking to it. Um, but uh, it, it's really great now because uh, it has a really great nonstick surface on it. Yeah, stick with it till it doesn't stick, exactly. Cool, a little far from every day. Yeah, do I use peanut oil when I deep fry? Uh, so actually, I don't use peanut oil for deep frying. Uh, I specifically don't use peanut oil because I think it, it's biased. Uh, peanut oil is super, super biased. Um, so we actually, we could talk about oils for a second because we have so much air time. Um, I like, so I do use peanut oil, but I only use it in wok stir fries. So I do use peanut oil today, but it was only during the wok fry of the uh, portion of what we cooked today. So I, when we did the garlic ginger uh, and then we tossed the chicken in it, that was peanut oil. Uh, the fryer oil is just canola oil because canola oil doesn't have a flavor. When you, when you deep fry, you don't want to impart any flavors. Unless you do want to impart a flavor, if you want stuff to taste like peanut, uh, then you can absolutely deep fry in peanut oil. Uh, but just remember that it's going to taste like your, whatever you deep fry, it's going to taste like whatever you fry in it. So you could, uh, hypothetically, you could deep fry in like, you could probably deep fry in olive oil, but it would taste like olive. Um, all of those things, uh, we want to pay attention to what the oil tastes like. So peanut oil, it tastes like peanut, um, which is why people ask me like what kind of oil to use for a wok fry. And I like to say is uh, peanut oil is definitely the most traditional thing to use in a wok fry. Uh, but what will happen is that the, everything that you cook in peanut oil, it will taste like peanut. So if you're wok frying uh, and you use peanut oil and you impart a little bit of a peanut flavor to everything that you cook, it will probably be okay for most things that you wok fry uh, because most of those things, they, it, will, it works out with the flavor of peanut. Uh, but what the problem is, is that if that's the only kind of high heat oil that you have to cook it with, uh, is that if you go in like the next morning and you want to make hash browns or something uh, and you try and use peanut oil for that, it's not going to taste very good. It's going to taste like peanut. Your hash browns are going to taste like peanut. Um, which is not great. So if you're going to have one kind of oil in the house, I would say it shouldn't be peanut oil. It probably should be something like canola oil or vegetable oil uh, or grapeseed oil. That's the other kind of oil that I have is grapeseed oil. Um, and then I would say maybe the second kind of oil can be peanut oil uh, and the third kind, which should be uh, olive oil. Everyone should always have a little bit of olive oil. Yeah. Uh, one of your biggest problems with frying is keeping it crispy after smothering in sauce. Yeah, totally. Uh, so that, yeah, that was a big problem that I had the first, like, probably the first 10 times that I did deep fried or did deep fried dishes like this. Um, and that's that what, what's happening is, is basically once you uh, add the fried chick, so you have to do a couple of things to make sure that it stays crispy. Uh, the first thing that we want to do is that it has to be really crispy. Uh, so we have to make sure that that chicken is very, very crispy. Otherwise, it will absolutely start uh, turning soggy in the fry. Um, so it goes extra crispy to make to compensate for the fact that it's going back into a braise, uh, which is essentially what General Tso's chicken. That's also what honey sesame chicken is, gochujang glazed chicken, all that stuff. Uh, if it has a glaze, it has to go into a liquid substance later, uh, which means that that's going to start breaking down the, the chicken. Uh, the other thing that we want to do is make sure that it doesn't spend too much time in that braise. Um, 
which means that's why if you probably noticed that the chicken didn't spend very long in the wok fry. It probably was only in there for like under a minute on wok heat. Uh, and after that, I removed it from heat because it, all, all we really need to do at that point is kind of uh, let it combine and let some of the aromatic elements combine with it. Uh, after that, we really don't need to do much after that. So uh, I think that like the really important part is that you have to, everything has to be already cooked before it goes into that wok fry. People, people who have a nut allergy can eat food fried in peanut. I did not know that. That's really interesting. But you once cleaned, some, cleaned someone's seasoned cast iron without knowing. Yeah, um, I've I've been told that uh, I've been told that you can actually clean a cast iron with soap and water. Um, at least that that's what I heard from Kenji Lopez that you can you can do that. Uh, and I have friends that have actually done that. I've done it myself, but it made stuff taste like tastes like soap. Uh, so I don't believe that. Uh, but what I've, what I've heard is that you can absolutely clean with a sponge on a cast iron. So I don't know. I've also, I've also used soap and water on my wok before. Um, but it's not like, it's not an arena that you want to be in frequently. I think, at least in my opinion, uh, I think that's like soap and water, sponges, stuff like that on carbon steel and cast iron. That's an arena that you can get into if you have to, uh, but you really don't want to be in that world because what will eventually happen is you're eventually going to start scrubbing off seasoning. Uh, and that seasoning is the most important part of that pan is, is the seasoning. Uh, without the seasoning, the pan is just a lump of metal and everything will start sticking to it. Um, so like uh, you can vent, you can clean stuff with the soap and water um, and like scrub it. You can even use, I've used uh, steel wool on my wok before uh, when the seasoning started chipping. Um, but you don't want to get into that world too often. Otherwise it will start, uh, you'll start scrubbing the uh, seasoning off. Yeah, super, super crunchy. Um, got some nice heat from that doubanjang. It's also like built pretty moist inside because of the double fry. <clears throat> I honestly, I recommend anytime that you're frying chicken, I recommend using that double fry. The only thing that I regret is not having chicken thigh. I think this would have been better with chicken thigh, but I didn't have any today. Yeah, yeah. In a minute, you can destroy your seasoning. Uh, I have also re-seasoned cast iron uh, pans and woks before. Uh, it's not fun because you have to get all of the seasoning. You can't uh, remove part of the seasoning. You have to remove all of the seasoning, which means that you have to scrub <coughs> for like actual, <coughs> actual hours. It's not fun. <coughs> so if you can help it, try not to get into the world of re-seasoning. Uh, which is why I say the number one most important thing about wok care uh, is to make sure that you clean it while the wok is still hot uh, because you don't have to scrub. Um, everything will just come off with a little bit of water. Uh, once, you, once you let it sit and let the wok cool down with stuff in it, uh, that's when you get into the world of you have to start scrubbing and like uh, uh, chipping stuff off. All of those things, things that we don't want to be doing with our wok. So just clean it while it's still hot uh, and everything will come off. Even if you have stuff stuck to it, uh, it will still come off with, with a little bit of wa water. Yeah, totally. Uh, name the rest. Oh yeah, I guess I should drop the recipe. There it is. <coughs> There's the recipe. Cool. I think that's it, everyone. Thank you all for tuning in. Uh, super stoked to see so many folks tuning in all the time. Uh, very exciting to see so many people coming back all the time. I know I've recognized a whole bunch of people, especially in the YouTube chat, who are popping over uh, and uh, checking out what's going on on YouTube. I love seeing familiar faces all the time. It's super fun uh, and super. I'm super honored to see so many people who keep tuning in over and over again. That's really cool. Um, if you haven't yet, definitely hop over to YouTube and check out what's going on over there. 
uh, there is a concurrent live stream happening every time that we stream over on Reddit. Uh, on that live stream, there's also a schedule of everything that we're cooking. So if you want to find out what I'm going to be cooking next, you can also get reminders for the next time that I'm going to be streaming. Uh, and you can also bookmark the things that you want to see. Uh, so lots of people have started bookmarking the things that they want to see and then they pick up the, you can pick up the ingredients for what we're going to be cooking because those are also included in the YouTube uh, chat. Uh, and then you can find out, find those ingredients and we can cook stuff together, which is always more fun uh, because we can talk about all of the stuff we messed up. I know I messed up at least two things today, so uh, if you can name the two things that I messed up, uh, kudos to you. Uh, in addition to the concurrent live stream, that's also where all of the recipe videos live. So this particular version of General Tso's Chicken, uh, it comes from a Panda Express hack that I wrote. Uh, that was essentially what we did for that hack was we deconstructed the Panda Express General Tso's Chicken uh, and then reconstructed it without all of the American qualities that Panda Express adds uh, and kind of like took a look at what all those American things are and then reconstructed it without the American qualities but replaced with uh, traditional Chinese cooking elements. So today we use doubanjang, uh, a little bit of oyster sauce, uh, mirin and Shaoxing wine, uh, all of which uh, kind of replaced some of the sweetness that we removed. Uh, so we only used half a tablespoon of brown sugar, um, which is very, very little brown sugar in any kind of Chinese American food. Uh, usually when I do Panda Express dishes, those usually have like a quarter cup or more of brown sugar. So this version of General Tso's Chicken has way less sugar in the, than most, most Chinese American food that I have come across. Uh, which is really, really interesting uh, because a lot of those dishes, they're not really Chinese after a certain point. They're pretty much just American food. Um, so if you're interested in stuff like that, definitely hop over to YouTube. Uh, check out what's going on over there. Uh, we're streaming every Tuesday and Thursday at 6.30 p.m. PST. Uh, Wednesdays at 6 p.m. Uh, and then new recipes that come out every Friday. So tomorrow we're doing a hot and sour soup with some shredded chicken, or poached and shredded chicken. Uh, that's coming out tomorrow morning. So I'm super stoked for that. Uh, that's one of my favorite, favorite soups of all time. Yeah, P. P Murphy Thea, thanks for tuning in. Thank you everyone for tuning in. Um, Happy New Year. Uh, tune in again tomorrow. So we're going to be back tomorrow at 6.30. Um, we're going to be doing some New Year's, uh, Chinese New Year stuff. So this is Nyingo. We're going to be cooking this up. Uh, this is a really, really traditional Chinese New Year cake. Uh, it's literally called Year Cake, Nyingo. Um, we're also going to be doing some green onion pancakes and some taro pancakes. So all of which are, are things that I have cooked on Chinese New Year with my family all the time. Uh, this year, uh, this year might be one of the first years that I have not gone home for Chinese New Year because of uh, COVID-19. So um, it's going to be really cool to cook with someone at least. So uh, tune in tomorrow. We'll be back 6.30 tomorrow uh, doing some Chinese New Year stuff. So I'll see you all soon. Happy New Year. Thanks, everyone.
Well, 